be anyone with electronic devices. If you can do the needful, um, now is the time to declare any interests. <coughs> if there are any related to today's business. If not, we'll move on. There's apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan. And joining us through the Starley facility, we've uh, got Linda Dillon, Doug Beatty, Rachel Woods and Sinead Bradley. And you're all welcome to the meeting. And I will ask the clerk to indicate any delegation of votes as per the relevant standing order. Under standing order 1156, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson Linda Dillon and Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the Chairperson Paul Given. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 2 then is the uh, draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 11th of March and if members are content that they are, are true reflection of proceedings then I can sign them accordingly. All members content? Content. Um, matters arising. The Probation Board has responded to the Committee's request for further information on its budget reposition and the likely impact of its draft 21-22 budget allocation, and those papers are in your meeting pack. The response sets out the likely impact on victims' board staff, the preparation of pre-sentencing reports, problem-solving justice initiatives, community and voluntary sector organisations funded by the Board, and rehabilitation of uh, prisoners. It also provides an update on funding for the Aspire and Engage initiatives and confirms that a business case has been submitted to the Department for PPE. According to the response, the Department has confirmed that it will seek to manage in year the inescapable pressures that have been identified by the Probation Board. The Committee also wrote to the Department on the concerns specific to the Probation Board along with a number of other issues. That response has not yet been received. So, members, the information is there uh, for noting uh, pending then the evidence session that we are going to have. Um, with departmental officials on the budget, and that will be on either the 22nd or the 29th of April, and obviously we'll be able to explore that further. Um, Linda Dillon. Chair, just again, and I, I did make this point uh, whenever we discussed the budget and have made it several times since, I have real concerns. We talk about a victim-centred approach in everything we do within justice. The minister has said that a victim-centred approach is a priority for her, but yet it appears to be that all of those things that are important to victims, and we've heard this repeatedly, we've borne it out in many debates that we've had in the chamber around victims of, of crime and, and the importance of communication and what's happening in relation to, to perpetrators getting out of prison and all of those different issues. and even the issue obviously around early intervention prevention and rehabilitation and it looks like all of these things are being neglected and this is where the money is being cut and i have big concerns around that because the reality is we all know that there are long-term savings to be got by keeping people out of prison there are big big costs involved and people ending up in the in the prison system but if we don't start truly investing in the prevention and early intervention, then we're never going to break that cycle and we're going to create further victims and not have good outcomes for victims and not have that victim-centred approach that we're always talking about and that the Minister, indeed, is always talking about too. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. I, I don't disagree with any of those comments, Linda. Um, obviously, for that meeting on the 22nd or 29th, we, we'll have a note of the areas that we want to cover. We'll make sure that those points are included in that um, briefing. Uh, and then we will in interrogate officials in respect of this when they are in front of us. Um, then item two, just under the matters arising, it is the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. The Department has provided the Committee with the update requested on the timetable and content of the uh, Justice Bill, and that is in the meeting pack. The Minister expects to seek executive approval to introduce the Bill in the middle of April, and that would provide then for introduction to the Assembly week commencing the 10th of May. The Department has already indicated that there are at least two policy areas that it intends to include in the Bill by bringing forward provisions by way of amendments at consideration stage. Uh, so, If members are content, we will ask the Department uh, for details of the areas on which it intends to bring forward provisions during the passage of the Bill. Again, I just note that um, introduction to the Assembly on the 10th of May were slipping in terms of the time frame. This was meant to be with the Committee before now. Um, that is obviously going to put significant pressure on this committee to try and get um, its work done on what is going to be a very substantive piece of legislation. So, uh, I just note, members, 
the um, delay in which uh, the department is now proceeding uh, in terms of getting this legislation to us. Um, so members were going to be busy uh, and under pressure once that does arrive. Um, and obviously, there's still a bit of time to travel yet in terms of getting this through the executive for May. So we will ask given these amendments are going to have two substantive policy areas if we can get that information as well because the more we get now then the better item four just then is the consent to serious harm for sexual gratification uh, not a defense the results of the consultation and proposed way forward so officials are attending the meeting today uh, they're going to make their way into the to the room um, uh, we're getting a briefing on the overview of the responses to the consultation to put into legislation the legal premise that it is not a defence that an injured party consented to the infliction of serious harm for the purpose of sexual gratification and the proposed way forward. The relevant papers, members, for this session is pages 27 to uh, 72 of your meeting pack. So can I welcome in person uh, Brian, Deputy Director of Criminal Justice Policy, and uh, Legislation Legacy Division, and also Angela, who is Head of Road Traffic and Sentencing Policy Review Branch, uh, both from the Department of Justice. We are both very welcome to the, to the meeting, and uh, we're going to record this, obviously, by Hansard, and then it will be published on, in terms of a transcript on our committee webpage. So, Brian, good to see you again um, here in, in, in the flesh, beyond the cameras that we've had to work with for quite a while now, so uh, you're very welcome to this committee, and I'm going to hand over to you at this stage. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, I suspect you're going to see an awful lot more of me in the next year, actually. I think you're right. <laughs> uh, I think we have two, two bills I'm leading, leading through. So, um, uh, And I would also note that um, Angela actually works for her, her branch is now the Sentencing Policy Unit, so in fact uh, we have had a minor reorganisation. Very good. In my division. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you know, most of you know, I'm Brian Grimmick, the, uh, the head, uh, Deputy Director and Head of Criminal Justice Policy and Legislation Division in the, uh, in the Department. Uh, with me, I have Angela Bell, as I say, the Head of Sentencing Policy Unit in my division. I'm pleased to be able to brief the committee on the responses we received to the public consultation, consent to serious harm, not a defence. And on the Department's plans, uh, for the defence of consent to serious harm for purposes of sexual gratification, often known as rough, the rough sex defence. This issue came to the fore in Northern Ireland last summer with the tragic killing of Newry woman Pat Patricia v v uh, Virebeck. This case has not yet been tried, so I can't really say much about it. Uh, however, I know it has been reported in the media that the defendant claimed that Pat Patricia uh, died as a result of consensual strangulation. Oops, sorry. Around this time, an amendment was made to the Westminster Domestic Abuse Bill to put into legislation the, the existing legal precedent that, where serious uh, injury occurs, it is not a defence to claim the victim consented for the purpose of sexual gratification. So, in, in essence, in common law, this is already is an offence. Uh, however, the Minister recognised this was an important issue, and I know there have been questions about the extent of that common law, law um, issue. And she asked officials to carry out an urgent review, <clears throat> and essentially noting that we were already carrying out a review on non-fatal strangulation, she asked that it, it, it would be taken forward as a priority strand of that, re that review. So in essence, we slowed down the main strangulation review so we can actually bring this forward and get it, get it to the point of uh, consultation and beyond. Um, uh, that, the work on uh, non-fatal strangulation, however, what is now actually getting back into train, and we, you'll be hearing from us later in the year on that. <clears throat> uh, the work on, on, um, on the, the rough sex defence included research into position in, in, in neighbouring and more distant jurisdictions, and with the assistance from members of, of a non-fatal strangulation reference group which we established, uh, we actually developed a consultation which we put out um, at the end, end of last year. The, um, the resultant consultation was a single-themed fo single consultation focusing on the specific question of whether people consider the law sufficient as it stands, and whether a provision similar to that being created in England and Wales uh, or something different uh, would be needed for Northern Ireland. The consultation ran from November to, to January 2021, 
Uh, it, in, the, in, in the end, it lasted for nine weeks. We increased, we gave a one-week extension at the request of, uh, of, a, of one of the uh, respondents. Members will appreciate that consulting during a pandemic is not ideal. However, we reckon that, noting that, we offered respondents the opportunity to engage directly with team members if they wish to discuss any aspect of the consultation. Uh, we provided for responses to be made online via citizen space and also made special provision for email and hard copy responses. Uh, the consultation actually was reasonably successful. We had a total of 175 responses. Actually, technically, um, we had 175 responses from 174 respondents. Uh, strangely enough, one response seemed to have came in twice. So we, uh, we noted the other day that numbers didn't seem to add up, and that's what it was. A total of 175 <coughs> responses were received from individuals and organisations and actually, there was a high degree of, of consistency of response uh, across most of the sectors. There was strong support for a change in the law, similar to the GP amendment and to its domestic abuse bill. But that alone was not seen as enough. Almost all of the respondents supported a programme of education, underlining, as we so often see, that improving public safety is not, it's not merely a matter for the, just, uh, for the Justice Department. Essentially, they, they saw this as being a much broader societal issue, which really needed a, a concerted campaign of education. And I think that also has to be seen in the light, as the committee will know, of the increase, uh, increasingly open accessibility to, to things like pornography, which it appears younger people are actually having access to in a way they never would have done in the past. Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps that education is about how we actually take take account of the situation as it is now, as, as opposed to what it was in, in, uh, in years gone by. Anyway, to, to continue, the summary of responses report, uh, which we circulated to the committee, highlights a number of key issues raised by respondents. Uh, I, I'm not aiming to actually rehearse all of them here, but I will pick up some of the, some of the key features which you might find it helpful for me to touch on. Firstly, my, most, well, many respondents recognise this was not exclusively a domestic abuse issue. It goes beyond the people living in a domestic environment. An important factor, and this, is, um, this was an important factor, and it's not, not been included in, in our earlier Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act. You know, and since it goes, goes well belong, beyond domestic abuse, and we, we felt it would have been a constraint to try to put it into that act. Uh, one area of major concern was the ease of access to ever more hardcore pornography on the internet, with inconsistent and variable formal education on building relationships. A real concern is that young people in particular have no standard to gauge what is normal. So the abnormal is becoming increasingly normal in Northern Ireland in the absence of, of indications of the, uh, otherwise. Um, this is an important theme already picked up by the Gillen Review, and our intention uh, going, going forward is to link into the, that work to promote a common approach across the department. I think Gillen already, already flagged significant issues for, uh, where education was needed and we would see any import of rough sex would not be a standalone bit of education, but rather part of, of a broader, a broader based education package, which we would hope would be propagated throughout Northern Ireland. Uh, as to the nature of the offence to which any new provision should apply, um, a large, quite, quite a, a number of respondents called for a new, a, um, a new offence um, um, really on non uh, of non-fatal strangulation. Now, that really wasn't what the, the consultation was about. This, that's part of our broader review on, on non-fatal non strangulation, uh, which, is, which is going ahead um, at the moment. There was also some calls for the, the offence to be recognised as a gendered issue. Um, now, I think the, technically we, we weren't quite so sure about that, because whereas most, uh, most people and recipients of this would be female, um, and there is a small uh, minority of, of males who actually have this issue, either on a, a same-sex relationship or even on a heterosexual relationship. So, well, though actually there were calls for it to be seen as a gendered issue, we actually had some, some difficulties with that because uh, of the, 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 those marginal groups. So these issues, in any event, will be picked up as part of our, un, our, our overall review on non-fatal strangulation. So, um, while well, they weren't specifically relevant to this particular exercise, and we, we've, we have, we've folded them into the broader exercise and non-fatal non strangulation. Uh, we'll pick up, let's say, as I say, we'll pick up the, those comments and, and some others in the wider consultation piece on non-fatal strangulation, uh, which is the development of which is now at a fairly advanced stage, and we would, I certainly would hope that we'd issue that consultation before the summer uh, as part of our plan to really uh, move forward to, to drafting 
um, some instructions later in the year on, on that. It's our intention now to build on the recent consultation to draft instructions for Legislative Council on the rough sex defence. The Minister's intention, actually, as indicated previously, is to introduce an amendment to the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill in the autumn covering this. And that amendment will, of course, be subject to the Justice Committee's consideration and detailed scrutiny in due course. So this exercise, at this point, I'm, I'm just giving you early warning of this, giving you an opportunity to see what the consultation has produced and indicate our direction of travel, the Minister's direction of travel. And, of course, Andrew and I are more than happy to answer any questions you may have on this or any related topics. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brian, and that is helpful, particularly when coming forward at the, through an amendment process, obviously, just to, to keep us engaged on it. So we, we welcome this engagement. Um, and at this stage, you, you mentioned that one case in, in your and I'll be careful not to, to go into that. But in terms of the, the extent of this problem, um, and it's maybe difficult to, to quantify, I note from the papers that research of, I think it was 2,200 girls and I talked, or, or, or women I talked about, and 38 per cent of cases, of, uh, there was 38 per cent indicated that there had been some form of, whether it's spitting, choking and so on. And it does lift the lid on something which is pretty unseemly. Um, but is there any information that quantifies the kind of scale of the problem here in Northern Ireland? But uh, I think the short answer is no. Uh, in essence, in fact, clearly behaviours are changing. Now, most of those, you know, spitting and other things like that, are um, slightly, certainly aren't, aren't very attractive. But at the same time, in fact, by and large, uh, they, in the main, are going to be consensual. Um, what we're talking about here is actually, you know, you put up, an individual can consent to whatever is agreeable between them and their partner, but at the same time, no one has a right to consent to allow a partner to damage them mm -hmm. physically. <clears throat> now, on, <clears throat> on the lower level issues, um, areas, um, I think, you know, if we actually promote, or if after this uh, legislation, uh, we promote better education, that's the sort of thing you want to pick up. But that's very much about relationships. It's about respect. It's about actually appropriateness of behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not seeing that the sort of thing you can easily deal with the law, uh, can be dealt with in the law. But what we can do is where you're going to get actual bodily, bodily harm or grievous bodily harm, then clearly that's something which should be picked up. And uh, at the moment, the common law well, does allow for this, you know, no one has the right to actually allow someone else to fear, uh, seriously damage themselves yeah. without damaging them. But that being said, you know, I know that you know, in some other jurisdictions there's been a bit of fraying around the edges of that particular bit of common law. Mm. So we feel it would be important to put it on statute. And that actually sends an important signal about, uh, uh, about this issue. Because yeah. ultimately we have to walk a careful line. A line on one side from being not, not fettering the, 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 the legitimate freedoms of people to, uh, to participate in whatever form of lawful sexual act they feel appropriate. But at the same time, in fact, not allowing in that process to, to have a situation where someone is seriously damaged or even in the extreme killed. Um, so I think certainly that our concern is one that, that in fact, consent, uh, consent, uh, that, that sort of consent would be seen as a defence against actually serious assaults or, 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 or worse. Um, we want to deal with that. But the other side, we want to put down markers so, in fact, people actually when they're actually making judgment calls, will differentiate between actions which are uh, permissible and actually which are reasonable and those which go beyond the pale. I think okay. if I could maybe yes, chip sorry, in as I'm well sorry. there, just on, yeah. on the scale of the problem. With not having <coughs> legislation in place, there's nothing to directly count. But on the non-fatal strangulation strand, um, there were statistics that between 2002 and 2019, there were 502 suspects charged by the PSNI with choking or strangulation, which resulted in a very, very small number of prosecutions because of the difficulties with strangulation legislation. Okay. But that, that doesn't really go to the, the full picture, but in, in respect of the choking, yeah. that's yeah. maybe an indication. Yeah, I would say that's both an undercount and an overcount. An undercount because we're quite clear a lot of these cases are not reported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, the, and that's somewhat, it can go I, everything because the person themselves is intimidated not to report to the, to the fact that it, it was, it, they, they rationalised afterwards that it wasn't intended or whatever. But the other side, so one side, there's an underreporting on that side, but the, other, but the other element is, of course, that's all non fatal strangulation. That won't, some of those won't be about uh, sexual, relation, sexual relationships which have gone wrong. 
some of them will be about domestic abuse and coercive control. So, in fact, you know, there are a couple of different strands there which um, muddy the water a little bit. And I note the, the number of times the defence has been used um, from 1972, 67 times, and 60 of which the victim has been a female in that respect. How, how successful is this rough sex defence when it actually goes to court? Well, the, it shouldn't be successful because the common law is, in fact, that, that the, uh, if someone citing the rough sex defence, um, the argument is, of course, that, in fact, um, you, no one has the right, to, even if they've given consent, that would not be a defence, but no one has the right to allow someone else to do them serious injury or, or, or mm -hmm. worse. Um, so it shouldn't work, but the trouble is, actually, it's like all these things, it's how you, where you draw lines. And I think is it, you know, there is a, a, I think there is concern that's an element of, of um, an element of um, uh, know, latitude, or else, in fact, there are some questions. Trying to have it certain in law would actually be helpful. You know, Andrew, you want to say anything more to that? Yes, well, that, that's true. There have been a couple of further cases since the 1994 Brown case, which have muddied the waters a little bit and maybe changed the parameters. Okay. Um, so that that's probably affected then the. the the full application of Brown mm -hmm. in all cases. So having a legislative statement would certainly clarify and, and make it more transparent mm -hmm. and obvious to people, and give them a good pointer that this is not acceptable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let me bring in some members then at this stage, and then I might pick up on it again. Um, Linda Dillon, and then Rachel Woods. Sorry, Chair. Apologies. Thank you for, for the presentation. Just just a couple of points. Um, just to be clear at the outset, I'm absolutely fully in agreement that the defence should be banned in statute. But the consultation did raise some concerns, and, and you've alluded a, a wee bit to them, Brian, already, around the new law curt curtailing non-conventional consensual sex. So how will that be reflected in legislation? Essentially, how do you make the boundaries clear between consent to rough sex but not to serious harm? And then again, you've, you've talked about the strangulation offences and, and when that review will be completed. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're saying that the consultation should go out prior to the summer recess. Um, although obviously we're always concerned whenever consultations are done over the, the summer period. So we'd like to avoid that. Is it, is it premature to begin drafting legislation before the review is completed and particularly given that issue around offences and the provision um, applying must include any proposed offences emanating from the strangulation review, you know, such as obviously the non, non fatal strangulation. And my last point then at the stage is just, again, you talked a little bit about the, the education and the need for the education in relation to this and RSE in schools is vitally important. But obviously, we're talking about education across the board, particularly around this issue, because it is a very difficult issue. So when we talk about education, it's about educating prosecutors, judges, juries, and the general public. You know, we, we need to tackle the myths and the stereotypes in, in relation to these cases. Like we've, we've already talked at some length within this committee about rape myths and the same kind of, of issues will emanate from this particular um, issue also. So if you can answer those few wee queries, I, I, that's, that's all I have for now, Chair. Okay, certainly um, <clears throat> you raised three questions there, which I'll just pick up in turn. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, first of all, actually, um, let me see. What was the first one again? Do you mind me, Angela? It was the level at which the amount of the, the injury caused? Where the oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> sorry, I couldn't read my writing there, my first point. <coughs> Excuse me. Where do you draw the line? How do we legislate for it? So, how do, you, how do you draw the line between consensual, non conventional sex and, you know? Well, I think, in fact, well, what we have done is taken, taken a leaf from what was happening in some of the national legislation. We've really drawn the line at actual bodily harm or grievous bodily harm. So we're recognising for, for low-level sort, of, um, sort of minor injuries or whatever, where, in fact, which could easily happen 
with a consensual area where there's something will have gone slightly wrong and someone's actually ended up, <coughs> you know, if someone actually sort of uh, twists, their, twists their knee or sprains a wrist or something, that, that's not what the aim is about. We're talking about where there's actually actual or grievous bodily harm. Now, it's always difficult to draw a line, but we thought three, really, those are recognised in law, so that would be a, sort of a good point <coughs> as we can manage. Uh, but I think, you know, we certainly had representation from, from, from some people who clearly, particularly from the LGBTQ um, 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 population, who felt that they, you know, it was important, they recognised the issue and they were happy about legislation, but felt it was important that we, we were careful not to actually impinge on their, on their freedoms to actually consent to engage in adventurous activities which could, have, could accidentally result in mi minor, minor harm. You know, uh, and that's not what we're, up, we're, at, we're after. We're after people who are actually are being seriously reckless and doing things which can cause uh, you know, severe or even life-changing injuries or worse. So um, that's the sort of line we've drawn. On this, uh, and you know, we're clearly open when we get up to the le drawing legislation about to talk about that. But really, we need to get a line where it's cla with, with clarity, because if we don't have a clear line, then in fact we have the same issues we have now in common law, probably, where you tend to find the boundaries become frayed and, and the law becomes uncertain. Um, uh, secondly, on the, the um, non-fatal non, non fa non um, uh, strangulation, um, in essence, in fact, um, we certainly aren't going to draft legislation before we've had a consultation. You know, what we're doing is if we're taking the normal process that the department takes for all, for all major policy, where we've actually got a team looking at the policy, we're developing our, our ideas, we've looked across jurisdiction to see what's available elsewhere, um, and then from that we're putting together a consultation paper, which is fairly, you know, it's not finished yet, but it's not far off it. That will go out for consultation. Uh, I said to this committee previously that, we, that this was something we saw ourselves doing during the course of the last year in a mandate, and our aim would be, in fact, to actually, once we've gone through that consultation and we've got responses, to actually move towards actually developing uh, instructions which could allow for legislation early in the next mandate. My aim is not, is not to, to rush this inordinately. What we want to do is make good law. So, in fact, we need to actually get to, get to the point where we've gone through a robust process. And then, so, we're talking about the consultation going out over the summer. Uh, we'll probably give a bit extra time, but it is over the summer. If, in fact, any of the respondents feel they need a bit longer, I'm, I'm sure we would, we are, we're always prepared to listen to, to significant respondents if they tell us they need more time. Uh, but our aim is actually to make sure we get good law. So we're trying to go through the normal robust process. So by the time I come to the committee and talk to you about this, we've got a well-developed policy which has, has actually been put out with consultation. We've got responses back. We've actually analysed those responses, and in some cases we may have gone back to respondents. Uh, respondents. And by that time, when we're actually start, starting to get ourselves ready to actually turn this into law, you know, we actually have a firm foundation on which to build that law. Uh, your final point was on education. Uh, I absolutely agree that education is critical on this one, because I, you know, particularly at a time where perhaps there are some changes in public, uh, or there are some changes in, in, in attitudes, and um, and behaviours. Uh, I think trying to get, get education in at an early point so people like uh, so youngsters um, actually know, have a better, they have a, a framework in which to judge what they're seeing in the media or are seeing on social media or they're hearing in the playground or youth club or whatever. So education is critical. Um, what we, we're, uh, the focus we're, we have on education has to be much it's part of a much broader issue about actually respect and how we actually deal with sexuality and things like that. Um, and we know, as you know, Gil the Gillen Review was very strong on that. And I can tell you now that, in fact, the way we see this going forward is uh, some of my colleagues in the Gillen Review have already been talking um, uh, with our minister and, uh, and they have met with Peter Weir and his team. And Peter Weir has agreed to chair a group going forward to look at this in the, in the, in the Gillen context. And what we would see is this folding into that work, because it's only just one aspect of a much broader issue about how you actually build, uh, um, build effective education, ensuring that actually sort of the appropriate respect um, is built into relationships. So that's work which will be ongoing, but we're not seeing this as being a standalone. We're seeing it as being folding into the work that Gillen 
you know, the, the Gillen report was very good in saying about how we move forward. And I think this is one aspect could be fitted into that work as part of what, what I hope would be a, an element in the curriculum in, the, in, in future years. Okay. Chair, sure, thank you. I appreciate the responses. I probably would, whilst I am talking to the education piece, and I appreciate Brian's answer in relation to that, it, it's exactly what we've been saying in relation to all of these issues around stock and the domestic abuse and, and, and everything else. That, education is vital. I'm also talking to the training piece and I suppose it's just to put it in your head, Brian, obviously we did make amendments to the domestic abuse bill around training. I'm quite sure Rachel will raise this issue anyway, but um, so, so I, I probably don't need to go into it in any great depth. She, she, she will no doubt be, be looking at the same kind of thing in terms of that training piece of PSNA prosecutors um, everybody that I suppose community is as as a whole, and that's that's probably more the education piece. But we probably do need training, and it would need to be, I think, in there as as part of any legislation forward. It's it's vital that in relation to these types of issues, the training is as a is a big part of it for those who will have to deal with it. And I suppose in terms of first responders, you're talking about first of all PSNA, and then right through the judicial process. So thank you. And as I say, Rachel is likely to bring this up. So I'm content to wait until Rachel comes in, Chair, rather than Brian having to say, say it twice. Right. Okay. Well, actually, I probably should have added that in. You know, I think it, uh, it almost goes about saying, you know, clearly when it comes to the justice component of this, any bit of new legislation, we have to say, how does it, how does it actually impact on the justice system? And that is about making sure that prosecutors, judges, um, policemen and uh, social workers, others who are involved in the process, you know, recognise what they're seeing. Because clearly, I suspect, you know, even in a number of cases, uh, even where actually an actual bodily harm is, is, uh, occurs, it may well be that, you know, this isn't reported. Uh, and, um, and it is about having a greater awareness of this so, in fact, it can be picked up. So uh, I think that will have to be an important and crucial part of... of the work we, but this department would engage in after, after the legislation is, is eventually passed. Well, certainly some of the responses to the consultation made that point as well when we did ask about training the criminal justice system in recognising and dealing with the issues that are raised. Um, so we would intend to build on the existing work that's already underway, including the, the No Grey Zone campaign, which is supported by uh, Queen's and University of Ulster, Women's Aid, NSPCC, Victim Support Nexus, PSNI, ourselves, and that, that will continue as well, um, along with hopefully some judicial training uh, that will develop from, from the responses going forward. Okay, okay thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for the presentation. I think Linda must be reading my screen from somewhere. So <laughs> I'll start with the, with the training, as it's been mentioned. Um, training is obviously a big, a, a big part of this, and any, any form of legislative change will require understanding of what that um, essentially means um, for criminal justice bodies, but also for frontline workers, PSNI and so on, the PPS, criminal justice agency and um, agencies and the judiciary. And I suppose just to pick up on the last point there with regard to judicial training, um, this is something that we'd looked at um, quite a bit in the mass produce bill and we weren't, um, weren't allowed to legislate for judicial training. So it, it ended up being criminal justice agencies that were under the department. Um, which I fully appreciate, although I note that the um, domestic abuse bill in Westminster has taken a slightly different approach in, in putting in judicial training. So I'm wondering if there had been any, has been any conversations um, in terms of putting this uh, sort of uh, essentially um, a copy and paste of Clause 65 of the Westminster bill into the justice um, miscellaneous bills and what that would mean for, for training. Has there been any discussions uh, with those that would need to be trained on it? Right, well, um, I'll maybe pass over to Andrew on that one. But first of all, before I do start, clearly on judicial training, um, the whereas actually we're not legislating for judicial training, clearly there is a judicial studies board, which is the main mechanism for actually training of judges in Northern Ireland, which we have used in the past on a number of bits of legislation where they've come in. 
and that actually has, um, <coughs> and I know from actually having my engagement with them, that they quite often would bring senior judges and other, other people who have been involved in the education process <coughs> in England across, England or Scotland across, to also contribute to that. And in those cases where their legislation has come in earlier, they've actually got practical examples of good and bad practice. So, um, so you know, I whereas, you know, clearly, I'll let Andrew talk, pick, pick up that your other point about um, chain, and putting in that uh, the Clause 65. Um, the truth is, actually, you know, we do actually have quite a good system in Northern Ireland where actually the Judicial Studies Board does actually sort of um, pick up these issues and actually, um, and it's something which I would expect them to do as a matter of course. Um, it's not, um, so, I don't know, Andrew, if you want to say anything about um, a point? Or um, no, really, the, the consultation focused on the, the, the generic questions <clears throat> um, about introducing the legislation similar to the, the domestic abuse amendment. Um, we would obviously need to consult a little bit further with the Office of Lord Chief Justice in relation to judicial training, but our experience has been the judiciary are keen to receive training on any new legislation and proposals uh, as part of their ongoing um, CPD type uh, awareness. So I would be very hopeful that they would uh, be very positive in, in receiving a suggestion for training along those lines. I think in fact ultimately we, we recognise we, we have a number of different systems than they have in England and it doesn't always, it's not always the case. Uh, we, our starting point isn't always to uh, slavishly replicate everything they have. But that being said, I'm very happy to, I'm very happy to steal good ideas and learn from others. Um, so clearly, as we go forward, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly look at that. But I, I know we do actually have quite a sort of a mature uh, process mechanism for training judges in Northern Ireland. And um, I'd be, I wouldn't necessarily want to try to actually replace it with something else um, uh, without having very clear that what we, we would do would be produce a better, a better outcome. So it's one, but certainly we'll be looking at as part going forward. But in fact, as I say, at this stage, you know, our, our focus was very much on actually getting the bit of legislation in place and then actually trying to build, start to build those relationships which we need to make sure that training and education is taken forward appropriately. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you for the, the, the answers. Um, and just in terms of the specifics, so the proposal and going forward is essentially um, the same then as 1265 in the Westminster Bill into the forthcoming miscellaneous provisions bill. Um, which means that it would only apply to GBH at assault occasion and natural bodily harm. So I'm just wondering, I do appreciate, as you stated, that you did need to draw a line somewhere, um, but was there any other offences considered? And were there any suggestions, say, coming from the consultation as why why those two were chosen? Or is it it, it is the same as the Westminster Bill in order to, to be clear and give clarity on, on the, on the offence? I think that the responses were overwhelming that we needed to actually have legislation, and I think they were pretty well, pretty overwhelmingly that, that, that people were happy enough with the, with the GB one. Uh, when we actually came to looking at lines, you know, we did sort of look to see whether there were any, any other easy options. But in fact, it's, it's much easier to say than to do on these ones. You know, in some ways, it's much it's helpful if we can identify clear-cut um, levels where, in fact, beyond which you can't go. Uh, trying to create artificial levels. Um, but um, what it could, could be potentially um, problematic and cause uh, unintended consequences. So the fact that you, uh, actual, actual um, bodily harm and grievous bodily harm are quite clear cut, it gives you actually sort of a, an area, you can, a line you can draw with some confidence and the police and others will understand it. Uh, and um, it, it means in fact, whereas you're moving it anywhere, anywhere, well, we wouldn't make it, we wouldn't actually require it to be more serious uh, uh, damage than, than GBH and ABH. To make it less serious, the great question is, well, where, do, where next do you draw a line? And that actually becomes very problematic very quickly because we don't want to criminalise people for, for actually uh, having consensual agreements to particular types of adventurous sex. What we want to do is make sure where people are acting with, with dangerous recklessness, um, which can actually damage another individual, uh, that, that they are discouraged from doing that. Our aim is actually, ideally, to discourage people from doing things which are actually dangerous, but where they, they do that actually de deliberately, then in fact what we're saying is, in fact, oh, you have to be responsible for the consequences of your own action. You cannot say, well, it, I, it, this was a consensual act, because in fact, clearly with a, a low level sort of, if somebody has a low, low level injury in, in the course of, it, of, of, uh, uh, of sex, 
Uh, that's, that's not something we're trying to pick up. But where actually, if, as a consequence of that, you get actual bodily harm, you get actually serious uh, damage, then that has to be, you have to make it, like, make it very clear that is unacceptable and will be a subject to, of the law. Thank you, Brian, uh, and I, I appreciate that. Um, and it leads me nicely on just to my, my third um, point, just on page 38 of our meeting pack, um, there was some proposals on the way forward in the last paragraph. And it was just if I could ask a question for clarity on the part that says, we have considered the request for the extension to cases where death occurred. However, the offences of murder and manslaughter are complex and their inclusion could result in unintended consequences. So I'm just wondering if you'd be able to explain what that means, what the unintended consequences you consider could happen with the, if, if the inclusion of murder and manslaughter would be put in. And um, just, it also mentions there about the court's role should not be fettered by legislation. Uh, just if you could clarify to me what that means. Yeah, I think in, in essence, well, well, we're very conscious, whereas we want to have the law is clear, uh, we also want to make sure that the judges are able to actually make judgments based on all the facts in the, in the case. When it comes to murder and manslaughter, um, the whole law around about manslaughter is quite complex to begin with. Um, in essence, in fact, if actually someone is killed as a consequence of your action, um, A, the, the, the law... You know, manslaughter is usually um, where actually the death occurs for a whole range of reasons, but essentially it's not with, with an intent to commit murder. It's actually something short of that. Um, we're quite confident, that, as they were in England, that those sort of offences, uh, if, if a death resulted, then either murder or manslaughter would be the obvious actually charges. But the fact that you're saying there's any consent is neither here nor there. Uh, if we started to try to build, particularly manslaughter, but uh, uh, into uh, the legislation, then you'll actually start getting into the, into the grounds of that manslaughter is quite a complex thing. There's lots of different uh, factors related to it. And to try to build that in, the, the unintended consequences will not be so much in the terms of, <laughs> of the, 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 um, uh, the legislation we'd be doing, but it, the impact on that, on other bits of legislation where manslaughter is used, because essentially what you have to have is a consistent bo body of law where actually everything applies equally across all offences. And bringing it into this, you know, I think England felt and we felt that that, that would actually raise, you know, raise significant pro problems. And actually we're not sure in this case, whereas the, um, the actual bodily harm or grievous bodily harm probably actually would be in a very grey area at the moment, um, or a greyer area, when it comes to murder, murder or manslaughter, that's much clearer cut already. And uh, we didn't have any sense that if, if, in fact, someone died as a consequence of an allegedly consensual um, act, uh, that that would actually, would actually prevent their, that, uh, that person being prosecuted for either murder or manslaughter. So, in essence, in fact, we felt that, 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 that um, it, it wasn't necessary. There was sufficient law at the moment, and B, if you brought it in, that they could actually you start to muddy water about actually sort of some aspects of manslaughter. I don't know, Angela, so I've, I've gone on a bit on that one. Is there anything you want to add? No, not on that particular point. Just in relation to the other um, offences that might have been considered, there, there was uh, probably the only area of divergence in the responses where a number of respondents were seeking a new sexual violence offence to be created and that that would then either remove the requirement for um, having defence outlawed because it wouldn't be part of that offence in the first place, um, um, or to create a new, the, there was a lot of uh, calls as well for the creation of a new offence of non-fatal strangulation in a similar terms. Um, as we've already said, we're, we're looking at non-fatal strangulation as well, and we think it's just more appropriate to leave that to the side and deal with that in that separate uh, part of the consultation. In fact, a lot of the ideas that were put forward have been quite helpful in us developing the work on the consultation for non-fatal strangulation. That was really the, the main area where there was any sort of difference of opinion. Thank you, um, Noah, and I think I do appreciate that these two issues are, are totally separate um, and, and, and they're not they're not the same uh, the same consultation, the same responses. Finally, Chair, I just um, on the issue of RSE, I mean, it's not surprising that this came through strongly in the consultation responses at all. I think it's well known and well understood of the importance of adequate and appropriate education being key. And, my view and my party's view are strongly on the record, so I'll not go into it again. But um, with regard to the Gillen Education and Awareness Group, 
in the briefing. It's um, there to support the call for consistent and comprehensive RSE. And um, I, I understand that there might be an issue here in terms of the department's remit um, and the limits uh, as it you know sits with, within education, but um, supporting a call for RSE isn't isn't good enough. We need to look at behaviours learned. And I'm just wondering, um, Brian, you'd said about the um, recent meeting between the Minister of Education and Minister of Justice. And I'm wondering if you have any information about that. You've mentioned about the Minister chairing a group on Gillen only. Um, I've submitted a couple of written questions on this. I haven't had a response uh, to date, but it was just if there was any agreed outcomes or forward programming that you are aware of. Well, I, I'll pass on to Andrew in a second, but what I would say is, in fact, I, I, it, it was the Gillen Group that, uh, that um, <clears throat> arranged the meeting between our minister and, uh, and Peter Weir, um, and clearly the focus was on education, but Gillen was quite broad on education, and we're quite happy that, in fact, education on, on rough sex, on the rough sex event, could, could easily be folded into that without an, any, any great issues. So our perception is actually it's part of a broader bit of education we need. And certainly the fact that Peter Weir has actually now agreed he'd chair a group to look at this, I think, is a, is a step in the right direction. Uh, now, Andrew, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, I, I just got a, a, a brief summary of that meeting from our colleagues de dealing in the Gillen Review implementation team. Um, and they advised that uh, the Education Minister will lead a subgroup of the Gillen Education and Awareness Group uh, to look at the provision of RSE in schools, including a review of the minimum content order. just uh, late last week so very very recent okay thank you appreciate that Tara. that's all my questions for now thank you thank you rachel uh Shanir bradley Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Brian and Angela. Um, no, to be fair, I think that uh, response to um, Rachel is was quite detailed, and, and I was were, um, really curious to know more about that Gillen review team. And I suppose, really, um, I, I'm not going to really ask a question, only to make a point that I, I do get the objective of the legislation, and it, it does appear to be steered on the right direction, but I'm just really mindful that the the education piece um and the change in, in so social um standards on this issue that you know what what is normalized and what is not um and the access i know a lot is referring here to possibly and maybe and a lot of reference but there's no real understanding on why there are these trends in behavior and the numbers have grown um, in recent years, and also, you know, the, the access to pornography, and there's no real solution, or I'm not sensing anything um, that can really get to the, the nub of the problem and be a sort of a preventative piece, even before the education piece. Um, and, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. And I realize, you know, I realize it's almost really difficult to come up with any sort of solution in that regard, but. I just wonder if there are any thoughts going to that earlier pace in this before the legislation has to pick up the paces. Thank you. Well, this is probably more a question you know, I, would, I would put to politicians and to civil servants. You know, the, rea uh, re the reality is, in fact, um, there have been changes, and that's obviously about the liberalisation of communication mechanisms available. The, the Internet has actually opened up enormously areas which previously would have been uh, would have been closed particularly to children um, so um, and I suspect this is down to changes in parental uh, behavior perhaps parents not being actually keeping up to date with in fact what their children can access because I know I mean I know I've certainly heard of some cases where people have been totally surprised at what their children were able to access or even actually access by accident you know um, I was hearing from a colleague only only today actually about actually getting getting material just uh, out of the blue uh, on TikTok, which in fact I know nothing about. Alas, you know I'm I'm, uh, I'm on three or four social media, but I'm not on that one. Um, so the reality is, in fact, this the accessibility is is significantly different than what it used to be, and and if you're asking me to, to speculate why actually things have opened up. I would say it's probably the fact that the world has moved on, the uh, technology moves at a great pace, parents don't keep up, they don't realise that children have access to stuff, and then 
I suspect playgrounds are great sources of, of children telling each other where they can go to get an interesting bit of, uh, bit of information or an inf see an interesting video. So uh, <clears throat> the reality is we can't stop the world from moving on. <clears throat> what we can say is what do you need to do in the context of the world moving to actually equip children to actually be able to be more discriminating. And in fairness, I think most children are more discriminating. And I, I'm not sure I, I'm, I believe that vast damage is being done to children in the main um, from these things. But what I would say is, in fact, it is changing some, some of the perceptions of what is permissible and not permissible uh, could be actually being eroded or, 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 or influenced. And I think, in fact, we need to equip children with the, the information, not to stop them accessing stuff, which, which is probably um, uh, not going to be possible, but at least just to make sure if they do access stuff, they make sensible decisions and they decide, you know, this is nonsense or this is actually uh, this is a fairy tale or this is inappropriate. So I think it's about equipping children. <clears throat> so that's why I think that education point is, is the critical one on this one. It's not enough just to have good law. You know, if we don't actually equip people to actually act responsibly within that law, uh, then we're just criminalising people to no purpose. Thank you, Brian. And, and there's nothing there I could disagree with, um, I have to say. But I, I suppose it does emphasise the point that, yes, we need to educate the children, but we also need to educate the parents and the, the guardians of those children who help that child make the determination of, you know, what is normal and what's not and what's being presented to them in, in different things, you know, not just in this issue, whether it's absolute nonsense made up and, you know, knowing those parameters and being able to put a, a, um, a healthy, um, I suppose, mindset to it. But thank you. I just, I just, I think we couldn't overemphasize enough the need to get the educational part as broad and uh, in terms of who it reaches and it's a, a real focus on what it, it hopes to achieve. But thank you. Thank you for um, both Angela and Brian on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think that covered Gemma's point, so she's okay. Um, Paul Frew. Yeah, just, just on that, I, I couldn't agree with, uh, disagree with anything you, you said there, Brian, in that last answer, because I think that's where the problem lies at the present time. It's the raft and mountain of material that's on the internet that all people including children, can access. And children will probably be able to access it quicker and easier than any, any adult, simply because they've grown up with the technology, whereas we've all had to learn it. So there's a massive issue there. As, and in you, your terms, you said about what's permissible and what's not permissible. And there's a real blurring of lines there with regards to what's acceptable and what's not in a healthy relationship and in a sexual relationship. And that's, I think, where the law has to step in and be that last line of defence. So everything that I've said there, it worries me then when I see departments' uh, responses, and I'll just read out one paragraph. Uh, it's the department's response and way forward in answer to question two. And I read the first paragraph. The department is conscious of the need to balance protection of victims serious injury, while at the same time recognising an individual's freedom to enjoy private consensual acts without fear of criminalisation. Any new provisions must be tempered to respect these potentially conflicting perspectives. Now, what I, what I take exception to that paragraph is, is that I, I think that the law should define what is permissible and not permissible, what's acceptable and not acceptable, and there shouldn't be a potentially conflicting perspectives. It's either going to be unhealthy or healthy. And, and I believe that's where the law should be clear. Um, and I, it worries me that, that, the, gov that the department is, is grappling with that, because I do, I do think that becomes then a, a dangerous mindset, whereby you try, <coughs> for want of a better word, you're, you're trying to compromise with some people's aspects and aspirations and ideals and mindsets around what is a healthy sexual relationship. Uh, and that worries me that you would be, the department could be, well, be prepared to <coughs> move positions on what is acceptable. Uh, I think on page 29, I think this is the Dallow's report, um, they say that the way forward, this is a sense of area in which it's important to balance protection of victims 
from serious injury, while at the same time recognising individuals' freedoms to enjoy private consensual acts without fear of criminalisation. Any new provision must be tempered to respect these potentially conflicting perspectives. So it's nearly as if we're going to compromise somebody's safety. It's nearly going to be we're going to compromise uh, and risk victims becoming seriously hurt because of someone's ideals. And I think that's where the department has maybe got themselves into a bit of a problem there. I, I agree with your the aspect of uh, rough sex defence. And so rough sex defence is removing of a defence uh, and and non fetal strangulation which you're now going to you're now going to consult on. I think whatever piece of legislation this stuff comes forward in, I think the two comes together, even though they're different. And what I mean by different is rough sex defence is the removal of a defence. Uh, and I think that's where you've got it right with regards to specifying offences of assaulting occasional bodily extra bodily harm and grievous bodily harm. Because that's a, an output. That is something that's happened. Mm. And that's where the defence shouldn't be able to be used. Uh, non fetal strangulation is where you're actually getting down to itemising what is acceptable and not acceptable in a sexual relationship. And that's a completely different scenario. And I think that's somewhere where the government has to go to. Um, so non fetal strangulation is an act, a sexual act. It's not acceptable, but it's still a sexual act. And the government, I believe, will rightly come in and say this should be banned. So, and I would support that. So I think when you move one in legislation with sex defence, I think by the very fact that strangulation is within, will probably be within that uh, description of rough sex, I think then the non-fetal strangulation will come also. Uh, so I, I would suspect the government will have to be prepared for that, the department will be prepared for that. Uh, but, but you understand my point where I, I think, I, I, I'm concerned that there's a tempering to use the terminology here, and dare I say a compromising of a position if you're trying to get a balance between victims being seriously injured and allowing a free-for-all with regards to what is healthy sexual relationships. Whenever we know we know what's, what's healthy and what's not healthy, well, um, Paul, you've raised a lot of interesting moral, philosophical and ethical issues. Yes. Which, uh, <laughs> Didn't mean to alas, do that, Brian. Right? Sorry about that. I suspect <laughs> that I'm not going to answer in, in a <laughs> sentence or two. Um, what I would say, though, is, in fact, uh, even what constitutes a healthy sexual relationship is not fixed, in, fixed at any one point in time. You go back to Victorian times and what was permissible and what was deemed to be appropriate. It's much different from what it was in the, in the 20th century, and it may be different from where we are today. Equally, people, what people do consensually in private, as long as, in fact, it doesn't cause serious damage or injury. You know, I'm not sure any government wants to start trying to get into the murky waters of deciding, making judgment calls on what act or what action or what uh, behaviour in that context is lawful and what isn't. And I suspect, you know, we'll get into very murky waters indeed if we try to legislate along those lines. So I think what... You talked about compromise. I think I, I prefer the word in some ways. What we've done is we've established a threshold. Below that threshold, I'm not saying you couldn't have non you you couldn't have people who in fact had had uh, consented to something and they were and they received received minor injuries. But at the same time, if it was consensual, if it's not not damaging third parties, it's not causing significant damage to either party. I'm not sure that's the world the government wants to start moving legislation into because I can, I can, I can list a whole, lab, a whole series of real practical difficulties and issues for the police or others trying to enforce any such law. But clearly, setting the threshold of where you get actual bodily harm or grievous bodily harm, that gives us a degree of clarity. If, in fact, you have that situation, um, the defence isn't available, the police ask what's going on. You know, now, at the end of the day, in fact, um, you know, then it's a matter of the law to take its course. So, in fact, I think what we're trying to do is produce certainty in law. And much as I like to, to, to dr drill into some of the interesting moral and philosophical points about you know, what constitutes an acceptable behaviour uh, between consenting adults in private, uh, I'm not sure you or I are ever going to get there. 
Uh, and then finally, on the non-fatal strangulation, the thing about non-fatal strangulation it isn't necessarily a sex act. It could just, it, it just as easily be a domestic abuse act, or it could be a, <coughs> some other form of coercive act where one person is trying to control another. <coughs> so since it is broader than just a sexual act, you know, and, I, and also I think when it comes to, um, to the issue of, of um, uh, the issue of um, uh, the consent, uh, uh, this sort of rough sex consent. The truth, one of the issues about uh, non-fatal non strangulation is it can be used as a means of control, means of control or, or coercion, but it often may not leave a mark. Now, whereas actual bodily harm and grievous bodily harm are probably clearer cut, you could see a situation where someone is, is, is putting some, another individual in fear of their life by actually non-fatal strangulation not necessarily leaving any, any significant marks. And we know that you know, that's often the case why you find strangulation isn't taken forward in courts as strangulation at the moment, because essentially, in fact, you know, there's that, that lack of certainty. So we're looking at that, but that not in a purely sexual line, and it's in with a specific issue about strangulation. It's different from actually someone actually in a domestic dispute punching their partner in the eye or whatever. You've got clear injury. Um, by and large, the person may be put in fear of their life, but often won't be. Uh, whereas with non-fatal strangulation, when you're actually getting someone to black out because of being, being strangled, you know, that is a, a, a step change in severity. And I think that's the sort of issue we'll be looking at in our review. But certainly when it comes to actually trying to uh, delve into sort of sexual, the sexual mores and practice in the 21st century, I'm not sure that the uh, committee or the assembly will want to really go that, go that way. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything you've said there with regards to changing uh, practices. But usually it has been the case through history that those have been applied in law as to what's acceptable or not. So is, is it the case then that we shouldn't run away from the, this aspect now Given, given the, the amount, the amount of material out there in pornography that we know is not acceptable or is not healthy, but yet our young people are seeing it, surely there, there is a question there, moral or otherwise, that for the law to actually step in, try and regulate what should be and what shouldn't be acceptable practice. Well, to start with, I'm not sure that we have used legislation to, to actually influence sexual practice historically. By and large, actually, it's, we've, you've got in law that, in fact, in law may well have set some, some delimiters um, in terms of rape or other sort of sexual offences. But what happens between ad consenting adults in private, I think, in the main, hasn't been a significant source of law. Uh, on, the, uh, on the issue of pornography, uh, I think that that horse, that horse has long since bolted in the sense, in fact, it is, the, the internet is actually a free, uh, open, accessible information source. It is, I wouldn't say saturated by pornography, but in fact, my understanding, some of the top hit, the, the sites with the greatest number of hits in the internet, the first half dozen of them, I understand, uh, are pornography sites or sites of that nature. So. Clearly, it is actually readily accessible, and I'm not sure. I know the government has talked uh, nationally, and this is a national issue when it comes to internet. Rather, this, this isn't a devolved matter we can influence in isolation. Um, that the government nationally has looked at actually putting down markers or warnings for, for children, or whatever, and that may have some effect. But as you've noted yourself, um, the children are much more adept than you or I are actually getting around these things, and I can guarantee. It would be no time at all before they work their way around any, any sort of lim delimiters or any barriers. So um, I think, in fact, you know, to some degree, it's probably better to assume that these things may, may continue to be available and then actually look at practical ways we can equip children so where they, they, become normal, they may become normalised, they're available. What we want is the response to be normalised where they actually recognise these are fairy tales, that they don't represent real life and actually relationships are, are quite different from you know, these sort of plastic images they see uh, um, and these commercially driven sort of um, sites. Yet, yet this material is what's creating victims and unfortunately the, the vast majority of those victims will be female going forward. I think we will need to catch this and grapple with this issue, you know, in, in the years and decades ahead. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your answers. 
Okay, if there's no other questions from any other members at this stage, obviously we'll we'll have a lot more engagement on this whenever the, the miscellaneous bill comes forward and, and the scrutiny process and, and the committee will very much want to be engaged in that. So um, we will keep this one very uh, close in terms of a watching brief on it um, and we'll pick the issue up again in, in due course. So can I thank right. um, both of you for coming to the committee today. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, members. So, we're, um, obviously, this this is kind of a preliminary session that we had there, just in advance of it coming forward. Once the the bill does come in, but obviously, this will be an area that we will pick up on. The the, the next session is an oral briefing session. So, um, and there the witnesses are here in person for that. So, we just need to give it a minute to clean down the surface, and then we will move into the the next session. So, folks, if we just take our ease for one minute. Very big. About half the size. How high are you? Okay, members. So we'll move into the next this next item on the agenda. It's item five, and we have officials here with us uh, in respect of the draft report of the 2017 targeted consultation prior to its publication and providing further detail on the proposals to develop and implement a statutory registration scheme for legal aid practitioners here in Northern Ireland. Um, those relevant uh, papers members are pages 75 through to 369. So let me formally welcome Stephen Martin, Deputy Director, and Ms Jenny Laverick, Project Manager of the Enabling Access to Justice Division um, from the Department of Justice. So you're both very welcome. Um, we'll do the needful recording, the session by Hansard. It'll be published then on terms of the uh, web page, uh, a transcript of the proceedings. So, Stephen, I think I'm handing over to you at this stage, yep, and then thank you, we Shane. move into questions. So, thank, thank you. you very much. And it's it's good to be here in person. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so, we're here today, as, as you said, Chair, to report to the committee on the outcome of the consultation that was carried out in 2017 on a statutory registration scheme, and to indicate the department's future plans to develop and implement the scheme. Um, following today's consideration by the committee, the department plans to finalise the post-consultation report and publish it in the coming weeks. Um, I'll be brief in my opening remarks to allow the maximum time possible for, for questions, which we look forward to. Um, the registration scheme is a mechanism for quality assurance of legally aided services. 
the key, there are four key elements essentially of, of a scheme. Uh, the first is that all firms of solicitors, individual solicitors and barristers will be required to register in order to continue to provide publicly funded legal services. Secondly, the requirements for registration will be set out in a code of practice for each branch of the profession. Uh, and those registering with the scheme will be required to comply with minimum quality standards. Thirdly, there will be some compliance processes administered by the Legal Services Agency to ensure that those standards are being met um, in accordance with the codes of practice. And finally, uh, the scheme in the medium term will be self-financing. So the costs incurred in, in administering it will be recouped through fees charged to those registering. In terms of the consultation, uh, the committee will be aware from, from our, our earlier written briefing in November that the key concerns raised by the stakeholders in the consultation relate to four things. Um, so uh, there was a, a focus on audit rather than uh, quality, the funding and the cost of the scheme. Secondly, thirdly, the overlap with professional regulation. And finally, implementation arrangements and timeframes. Um, the post-consultation report attempts to address these issues, and further work will be undertaken in the coming months, um, with a particular focus on two of those issues, um, the overlap with professional regulation and, and the funding and the fee. Sort of coming towards the, a close then, the, the quality has a number of dimensions. The initial focus of a registration scheme will be on the quality of customer service and on the administrative practices that support that. This represents the heart of what we're calling a minimum viable model for initial Im implementation of a scheme. This approach aims to deliver the Public Accounts Committee recommendations without further delay, while also addressing key concerns raised by stakeholders. The Department's aim is that the scheme will, will build over time to assess other aspects of the quality of legally aided services. The Department has initiated a project uh, led by Jenny to implement a registration scheme. The focus at this stage is on developing the proposals and four pieces of subordinate legislation for consultation this autumn, with a view to having the legislation affirmed in March next year and the scheme operational within the Legal Services Agency by the end of 2022. We have begun further engagement with representatives from the Bar Council and the Law Society through a joint reference group. So far, we've met once, and we, we've a further meeting planned for next week. Um, so, thanks again, Chair, for the opportunity, and we look forward to your questions. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Stephen. Just picking up on that last one, the meetings with the, the legal profession. Would they accept the need for the statutory registration scheme? I know they had voiced some opposition in the past, or, or some members of it anyway. What's the general consensus there now? Yeah, I, th I think I think it's still mixed at this stage, Chair. I think if there was no cost involved to them, they would be more accepting. I think the cost is an issue, um, and the overlap with professional regulation still seems to be be an issue. But I think they accept, in general, the principle that there needs to be quality in, in legally aided services. It's just how we we reach that point. Um, but we've had some good engagement so far, Jenny, yeah. um, haven't we? And um, they're continuing to engage with us, Chair. So, you know, I, I, I think as we indicate in the post-consultation report, we're trying to do a number of things to address issues that they raised in the last consultation. So we think there are grounds there for a really good scheme that they can buy into, but we just haven't quite got them there yet. And in most professional bodies, um, individuals will have a registration process. My wife works in the NHS and has to pay a registration fee herself in the NHS. Don't cover the cost for her. But she needs to do it to keep her registration up to date. Um, so, in terms of those registration fees, is that still a, an area of conversation around how you would recover the cost of such a scheme? It, it is, Chair. So, we're, we're working with them. I, mean, I think in the, in the 2017 consultation, we had costs of around 700,000 to be recouped. We're now looking at a much more modest fee. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that if the, if the committee are, are interested at this stage. But there will be some form of fee. Uh, it's just how, how much that will be and when it will kick in is the issue. Um. In, in terms of um, those that register under this scheme, uh, and maybe I'm going off off piece here a little bit, but um, one of the areas that gets raised with me is around the um, the way in which legal profession can be held to account so some people don't feel they've got the right service from um, a legal professional 
and then that's self-disciplining because obviously it's internally dealt with within the law society and so on and the accusation that well good luck getting a solicitor to take on another solicitor and, and so on if you're not yeah. happy with the service is there any aspect within this kind of registration process that here's a standard and there would be an independent way of assessing whether or not people have delivered yeah, very much our focus is on customer service, customer uh, sort of care at this stage, Chair. So absolutely there would be opportunities if in a legally aided service that somebody feels they're not getting the, the service that they require, that there, 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 you know, there will be an, a, an avenue for them. Um, and I think, Jenny, I mean, if you want to come in there in terms of some of the methods that we'll, we'll perhaps use around customer surveys and so on to... Yes, so some of the aspects of this registration scheme, the compliance with the minimum standards, would be assessed through sort of checks of, um, sort of financial management systems, case management systems and things like that. But someone moving into that quality aspect of it could be measured through things like customer surveys, or client surveys, feedback, um, that sort of thing to assess what sort of service the, the client feels that they're getting. Now, obviously, there are issues around that because... That's quite subjective, you know, in, in terms of yeah. how somebody views how their case has been handled, either by by their um, representative or by a representative on the other side. So there are issues around that, but mm -hmm. the um, the scheme will include something, so uh, w w ways of measuring m measuring that and getting that fed into the process. Okay. Well, listen. Let, let me bring in some other folks at this stage. Um, but thank you for that, uh, Linda Dillon, and then Shania Bradley. Thank you, Chair. And, and you've, you've touched on, on a point there that I was going to raise around the um, quality assurance. And I mean, obviously, you've outlined what some of the suggestions are, but I think that you have alluded to where one of the biggest challenges will be in terms of those responding. It depends what the outcome was, whether they're going to like or be positive, I think, more than what the actual service was. And, and that's something that I find, even through my own constituency office, people will often ask you to, you know, would you be prepared to uh, recommend a solicitor? I would never, ever, ever do it. Um, and that's because if they don't like the outcome, they won't like the solicitor in most cases. And that will come back to me. But also, it's not my place to recommend any solicitor and I just wouldn't do it. But, but that is certainly a factor in it for me so that, that's that's one of the points i would like to raise just in terms of the the, the model and um, in terms of the cost recovery model and i would like to actually if 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 you have stephen got the the kind of what the cost recovery might be that would be, certainly be of interest to myself but in terms of the cost rec recovery model have there been are there any other models on the table or is, is, is what we're looking at really where it's going to be and I mean I suppose in terms of what the chair just said I, I would acknowledge the fact that you know he's right you know nurses do have to pay a registration fee nobody pays it for them they have to pay it to stay on the register to be able to practice but what will it mean really what I want to know what will it mean is there likely to be an access to justice issue here where maybe you would have certain areas across the north where you might have very small numbers of practices signing and registering and then that then leaves as a real issue for people in accessing a solicitor now if that's not going to be the case then i'm, I'm probably thinking along the lines of where the chair is going my last and final point um, in relation to this is just how realistic is it that we will get the legislation through in this mandate. As you've already said, we, there are four pieces of subordinate legislation. And given that there are problems that still have to be ironed out, um, is it realistic because problems have to be ironed out? And, and the committee is, as, as you would know, like you're saying, the department under quite significant pressure around legislation. Thank you for the presentation and, and really appreciate you making a brief statement, I have to say. Um, perhaps if I just take those in, in turn then, um, I think that there are two distinct aspects uh, in, in quality and, and you've highlighted those. One is the quality of advocacy or representation and the other is the quality of kind of customer care and, and administration. Um, 
we have an aspiration to test the quality of advo advocacy and representation, but in the longer term, um, that's something that will take a lot of careful work, and there are a number of different options. One of the things that we will do as part of this, this work is develop some um, options for what that might look like, but that won't be part of the minimum viable model to be delivered at the start. The focus will be very much on the quality of customer care and the administrative processes that support that. So, you know, for example, the kind of thing I mean are, you know, has it been properly explained to, uh, to the client, uh, you know, what the, the solicitor or the barrister is going to do for them? Have they been kept updated on their case? It'll be those kinds of issues rather than, you know, has the representation been good? You know, has the advocacy at court been effective? That, that's for further down the line because that will need more work. Um, secondly, and on cost recovery, I suppose what we're trying to do is we will be doing a regulatory impact assessment as part of this. So we will try and work on the basis of the previous consultation of a scale of fees. So um, the, the scale will be based on the amount of legal aid work that somebody has done in previous years. So bigger practices will pay more. Smaller practices that do less legal aid work will pay less um, as a general principle. The detail is to be worked through, but as a general principle, that's very much what we're looking at. And we're alive to the access to justice issues, because particularly in some rural areas, there will be practices who do fairly small amounts of legal aid, um, and it's important that they continue to be able to operate. So we're very, very alive to those issues, and those will be will wash those through this regulatory impact assessment, which, which Jenny will be leading on. Um, the third question in terms of the realism, we know it's going to be quite tight. Um, there would, in extremis, be an opportunity to bring the legislation, push the legislative time frame back a little bit and bring the four pieces at the start of the next mandate and still implement the scheme by the end of 2022. So that's a fallback position, but we're very much working at this stage to having the four pieces of legislation um, drafted uh, for consultation by September and with the committee after Christmas. And the other um, part of our team is a, is a lawyer uh, in, in, in my team who is working with us on, on drafting that. So as we're going, she's drafting the legislation um, and we've got a fair bit done already. Thank you, Chair. That, that's all my questions, and thank you to both Stephen and Jenny. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Stephen and Jenny. Um, Stephen, you did touch on it there, and I was concerned. It's it's those small rural or small towns um, solicitors that perhaps don't have huge volume, but it might still be a large percentage of their business. Um, so they wouldn't have the volume. So that layering proposal um, does sound to g give some recognition uh, to making it affordable to those solicitors to continue to offer legal aid. But could I ask, are there any safeguards? I mean, and dare I say it, that the, I suppose the perception is that whatever fees or that may just be appearing then in another format on the client's bill. And ultimately, you know, while we look at the digitalization perhaps of legal aid and, and the future facing system that will have to be paid for, um, are there any safeguards to say that, you know, the, the client ultimately won't end up picking up additional tab um, to cover those costs? Yes, I mean perhaps if, if I if I start and then and then Jenny can pick up on this. Um, we're not raising legal aid fees as a result of, of this, so there will be no additional um, legal aid charges made uh, as a result of, of 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 these changes. So, in that sense, um, you know the public purse won't be paying any any more. Um, and as I said, the fees will be a proportion of the legal aid um, levels that are. are are being earned by particular firms or, or, or individuals. Um, in terms of, of the rural uh, and small town businesses, Jenny, in terms of the, do you want to talk a little bit about the rural impact assessment as well? Yes, so as well as the regulatory impact assessment, we'll also be carrying out um, a quality impact assessment and rural impact assessment to um, assess the impact of that across the, uh, you know, across all of Northern Ireland and across all different sort of sizes and, and makeups of businesses, and um, so that 
that process will help to identify any impact and we are very keen to get um, involvement from the professions on that as well to make sure that they are able to feed into that process as we draft it and then those will be put out for consultation as well. Um, from the initial um, issue, the, from the, the, the 2017 consultation, um, some of the issues they raised in particular were in relation to um, the younger members of the bar, for instance, who um, sort of recently qualified, um, and the other sector um, that we will have a particular eye to is the voluntary sector, who some of whom operate, um, provide legally aided services, a very small number of cases per year under a fee waiver from the Law Society, and again, they wouldn't routinely deliver legally aided services, but they do occasionally, and we just need to make sure that we're not having an adverse impact on that se on that sector as well, and, and the sort of the, the consequent roll on into sort of access to justice from there. So all of those things will be considered as part of the impact assessment process. Thank you. Uh, that's reassuring to hear because I think um, once you leave, you know, you go into rural towns and villages and that they are the, the type of um, legal issues. But I, I do take your point, Stephen, you're saying about the legal aid and I, I get that. But ultimately, you know, I'm just thinking of the, the broader legal offer um, that if this registration process, and I don't know the figures and I'm not sure that I would put you on the spot um, in terms of any proposals around that. But there are other legal um, issues that we encourage people to partake in, such as have a will, um, have certain things, but nobody knows the cost. Nobody ever can have an absolute cost associated with that. And I'm just wondering that as these pressures may be mined in other places, um, it, it could present on a client's bill and something that otherwise we would be encouraging them to do. Um, so, you know, and, and the chair and others rightly pointed out the nurses and I know even in teaching and the temp, um, register for supply teachers, they pay up and there's never a point where you can pass that call. I think we might have just lost Sinead from the broadcast. So um, I will bring in Rachel Woods. And then if Sinead comes back in, I can always revert back to Sinead. So if we can bring in Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of my queries have already been made, so I'll not labour them too much. I just want to bring back, are, is any other um, statutory registration scheme anywhere else operating? You know, is they operating in the rest of the UK and the Republic? Or is this a sort of something that is across the board, that there isn't a statutory registration scheme? So in, in England and Wales, they, they do a thing called contracting. So um, firms of solicitors bid for, for contracts for particular aspects of legal aid work, and only those firms that are contracted can then um, do that work at a, at a, a sort of set, set series of fees. And quality assurance then is, is monitored through the contract. Um, so that's the England and Wales approach. Um, we did a scoping study in Northern Ireland, but because of the size of our market, um, w the, the study concluded that contracting wouldn't work um, in Northern Ireland and it would have all kinds of, of perverse um, outcomes. So, so we decided not to go down that route. In Scotland, they do have a, a fairly well-developed scheme um, and they've also got peer review as part of that scheme. So the quality of advocacy and representation is, is measured through... Uh, uh, another colleague coming in and, and examining the, the service or um, you know provided the representation provided or, or the advocacy but that scheme has been running in Scotland now for a number of years it's a very mature concept um, slightly different from what we're proposing but not you know the Scottish model is one that we might look to as we we further develop our scheme the Republic of Ireland as far as as far as we aware, doesn't have anything similar doesn't have anything similar because their their equivalent of legal aid services are provided through law centres. So there is there is sort of a form of registration for that, but it operates really quite differently from from how our uh, legal system is set up here. So Scotland would certainly be our closest equivalent. Thank you. Um, no, Justice Edwards, sorry, excuse my ignorance in terms of how it's administered elsewhere. But it's just, uh, um, you mentioned there about it might look to Scotland in terms of their well developed scheme, which obviously has peer review in it. Is that something that has been discussed with 
um, the you know the, the group um, in terms of driving this forward. And um, you know we, we do love to copy Scotland's good ideas. So if this is something that's working well, you know, is it is it something that could be considered? going forward and also just on Scotland and appreciate you might not have this information, but uh, are, is there a, ch a registration fee as part of that? There isn't a registration fee in Scotland and, I, and this is a, a, a bit of a bone of contention with the legal profession here, um, but there are registration schemes in Northern Ireland, as the Chair has mentioned, for a range of other things, including landlord registration for private landlords and taxi licensing where there are fees. So the general approach in Northern Ireland is these things need to be self-funding. Scotland seems to have a different approach and there is no fee. Um, and, and as I said, that is a bit of a bone of contention with the, with the legal profession. Um, in terms of where we might go, one of the things that we, we are doing um, is as part of the consultation, we will be flagging that we, uh, we we want to further develop the scheme and we're hoping to engage some external expertise to help us develop what the options for that might be. But we're very clear that those that those further developments will come you know, after the initial implementation phase, so from year three, four, five onwards rather than right at the start, because we're very clear we want, we're really keen to get something effective up and running that can then be further developed. And that was very much the experience um, for landlord registration, for example, in the Department for Communities, it was a minimum viable model that was then further developed. So uh, that's the kind of approach, um, as I was involved, obviously, in, in that. So that's the kind of approach that we're, we're looking to develop here. Okay, thank you. you know that, that's all from me now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doug Beattie. Sure, thank you. I'll be brief, um, Stephen. I mean, I, I'm all well, I'm, I'm all for for registration schemes, and and um, uh, I, I'm all for codes of practice. Can I just ask you? I mean, just looking at some of the responses in that document we've got in front of us, why would stakeholders be concerned on a duty to report uh, criminal behaviour? Uh, that's a, that's a good good question. I, I think I think one of the issues is the the link between this scheme and the professional regu regu reg regulatory excuse me excuse me uh, regulatory responsibilities of the law society and the bar because there's a there, there is a duty to report to to those schemes so it's it's about how the registration scheme interacts i think with with the, the the regulatory responsibilities of both professional bodies and that's something that we know that we need to do further further work on so I think that that was probably the fundamental um, concern is you know what was this scheme for and how did it link with those those other responsibilities yeah thanks I, and I guess I mean it was a very short and pointed question um, Stephen and, and it, but it is very striking you know um, when I read that and, I, and I'll read it out loud stakeholders all had stakeholders also had particular concerns in relation to the proposed duty to report fraudulent or other criminal behaviour. I mean, that's that's quite damning that any any stakeholder or any, any solicitor, any barrister would, would 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 have that concern. But are you really just saying that that's just a a technical issue on on how the code of practice could speak to what's already in in, in place? Is that is that the issue? Yes, I th yes, I think there were there were two issues. So that was certainly one. The other was the scheme that we consulted on in 2017 was very expansive, and I know you had a, a briefing last week from the Legal Services Agency on its its fraud and error work. The, the the scheme that we consulted on included all of that work, which is now being taken forward through a different sort of route. So I think those concerns should be should be properly allayed. But but there is still an issue to resolve around how the fraud and error work the LSA do, how the professional regulatory responsibilities of the Law Society and the Bar are conducted, and how the statutory registration scheme, how the three link. So, I mean, it's, it's a fair point. There's, there's concerns there, but it's more about the linkage, I think, rather than, you know, a, a, an effort to avoid uh, sort of reporting poor, poor practice or criminal behaviour. And, and any registration scheme, um, Stephen, would be, would be public, I take it? Yes, a register. Usually, in registration schemes, um, the register is publicly publicly available. Um, so, 
I'm not sure in this scheme. Jenny, so I think we... that would be the intention yeah. because I mean that's the, so then uh, clients can then see who who is eligible to provide, who is registered to provide legally aided services. So yes. And then would that would that then marry into the other consultation, which is asking about whether um, we should publish how much legal aid each solicitor or barrister then receives, and the two speaking to each other on that issue also? Um, yes, we haven't we haven't been actively looking at that link, but yes, there are, there will be links around around all of that, and um, because the scheme will be administered by the Legal Services Agency, who who will also be publishing that information. So yeah, there's further further work to do in terms of. The, the linkages between all those various aspects. Thank, thank you, thank you, Chair. Hey, thank you, and I think Sinead, when we dropped off with you, you were pretty much finished. But I'll just bring you back in just in case. I think you were nodding. Whatever's happening. Oh, speaking. Hear you now, my way. No, I think that signal, I, th I think we have it covered, so thank you. Um, any any other members at this stage? Are we content? Um, obviously, before I have a lot of solicitors and barristers contacting me, I appreciate they sign professional fees to register with their professional bodies, and that's not quite a like-for-like -like comparison on the registration for health professionals and so on. Um, but, uh, yes, on the wider point... Um, I think the travel of direction, my own view on this is that um, you know, whenever it comes to the administration of public funds, which is what legally it is, um, there needs to be some form of registration for that. And, and we've seen uh, different registration schemes in other parts of, um, of our kind of government structures. And to me, this is in keeping with that, notwithstanding the wider issue of trying to make sure it's as cost effective and, and gets the buy-in from the, the legal profession and, and so on. Um, and obviously you're, you're going to continue just to try and finalise things and navigate that through. Um, but but uh, I get the principle behind this and it's, it's one I certainly have understanding for. So um, in that respect, can I thank you both very much for thank your you. work on this. It's much appreciated. Great, thank you. Okay, members, well then, um, if you're content, we'll note this uh, report. Um, at this stage, obviously, the department's um, indicated it's proposed way forward around this area, um, and then the department wishes to engage further um, with the committee in the autumn in respect of its planned public consultation, which it anticipates to launch in September um, 2021. Um, so we'll schedule that into the forward work programme, and then we'll be able to, to pick this issue up again at that point. Um, okay, members, um, agenda item six is just building on um, last week's discussion that we had around the damages return investment bill, the consideration of proposals for committee stage, so pages three to 25 of the table pack. Um, following the detailed discussion last week, committee agreed an extension until the start of the Halloween recess should be sought for the committee stage of the bill. Given the volume of legislation, the committee has to manage other committee work priorities and available resources. So a provisional timetable based on an extension until Thursday the 28th of October has been provided, together with the wording of a motion to extend the committee stage until that date. So if um, members are content with the proposed timetable for the committee stage of the bill, and we can keep that under uh, review as well, then the motion that's going to be lodged in the business office will read that in, in accordance with Standing Order 33-4, the period referred to in Standing Order 33-2 be extended to the 20th of October 2021 in relation to the committee stage of the damages return on investment bill. Um, so in respect of that issue, the debate on the motion would be scheduled for the week commencing the 19th of April. Um, Linda Dillon, I see your hand up there. Thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to check, Chair. Obviously, we had talked to this and, and the fact that all of all of the members of the committee, without um, for putting undue pressure, either on ourselves but particularly on staff, wanted to to do this in as timely a manner as possible. Um, I think they look. I'm just wondering: is there is there any parts of the, the scheduled timetable that can 
can be shortened or reduced in any way. It just looks like it would be very tight to get it done for Halloween, never mind before Halloween. Um, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm looking a bit of a stare, a bit of guidance in relation to that, Chair. Yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's a tight timetable because members wanted it before Halloween. Um, so there isn't a lot of latitude within it. But Christine, maybe you want to, to pick up on that point? Um, yeah, I mean, when you said it out, it does look tight. Um, just given the rest of the legislation that we'll have as well and the miscellaneous bill obviously coming in May. I suppose we can look, um, I think it largely depends once we get the written responses in, um, how many oral evidence sessions we need to schedule. Um, so depending on that, you might save some time there. And the hope is that if we can get the written responses from the department um, before the end of June, we can take oral evidence, then we can start um, putting together the issues for consideration at the beginning of September. I mean, I think it really depends on the volume we get in in the stocking bill as well. So it's it's very hard. This is our best guess at the minute. Um, it's really hard to, to see um, where you can save time. Having said that, if there's only a few evidence sessions, that could shorten um, something for this bill. We're just also conscious that we have to sign off on the committal reform bill by the middle of June. So we're trying to give as much flexibility as possible within the time scale the committee agreed last week. Okay, Chair, thank you. Okay, Linda. Um, the pro it's proposed within that um, information and, uh, on this aspect of the agenda. The closing date for receipt of written submissions on the bill would be Friday the 30th of April, and that takes account of the Easter period. So there's a draft media sign posting notice to be placed in the three main newspapers and on the Assembly website um, has been provided together with the draft list of the key stakeholders to which it is proposed the committee should write inviting written evidence and a draft letter um, would go to those stakeholders. A targeted list of stakeholders has been prepared reflecting the relatively specialised nature of the policy area covered by the legislation and includes the stakeholders who provided substantive responses to the consultation exercise carried out by the Department of Justice and others who have already contacted the committee regarding the Department's policy proposals. And that list can be reduced further if members um, feel that, that would be appropriate. Alternatively, a further list of other stakeholders that were included in previous requests by the Committee for Evidence and other bills has also been provided, and any or all of these can be added to the final list if members wish to do so. Um, a list of potential issues that the Committee will be considering when scrutinising the bill has also been provided, and these can be included in the letter to stakeholders if they are considered appropriate, um, and they will be highlighted on the Committee bill webpage. I know Sinead had passed on one of the the groups, I think they are included on the list, yes, um, so th th they are included. But if there's any other groups, members, when you, you take a look at that list that haven't been included, that you want included, just drop the clerk a note on that, and there's no issue in terms of adding to that. And um, There's probably quite a lot of those groups that don't need to be contacted, but um, that's not really, it's for those organisations as opposed to decide if they wanted to put in a, a submission. So can I just run through a number of these areas? Just to formally get that um, minuted, if members are content then with the date of Friday the 30th of April for receipt of written evidence, members agreed. agreed. And if members are content with the media sign posting notice, which will be published week commencing the 22nd of March. Content. Agreed. Um, and if members are content with the draft letter to go to stakeholders and to include the areas on which views would be particularly welcome and whether there's any other areas to be added. Members content with that. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, and if members are content, then we agree the targeted list of key stakeholders that they would be invited to submit written evidence. If members are content, and anyone that people want added, please just notify the clerk as soon as possible. Um, the department has provided a delegated powers memorandum, which identifies the provisions in the bill which confer powers to make delegated legislation and outlines the reason for taking each power and the nature of it. So, to assist the committee's consideration of the delegated powers in the bill, normal practice is to forward the memorandum to the examiner of statutory rules and to seek her views on whether it is appropriate for each of the powers outlined in the memorandum to be left to subordinate legislation rather than including it in the bill itself. 
and whether the choice of assembly control provided for each power is the most appropriate. So again, if members are content, we'll agree to refer the delegated powers memorandum to the assembly examiner of statutory rules for a report highlighting any issues that the committee may wish to consider. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Linda. Um, agenda item seven then is the protection from stalking bill. Consideration of further proposals for the committee stage. At the meeting on the 11th of February, the committee agreed arrangements for seeking uh, written evidence on this bill. It was also agreed that further consideration would be given to how uh, to bring the bill to the attention of individuals that have experienced um, stalking behaviour and encouraging them to share their experiences and provide their views on this legislation. Um, proposals for this have been drawn up in conjunction with the Assembly um, Comms Office and they are set out in the paper. They include developing a blog to publicise and explain the bill, using social media platforms um, to reach a wider audience uh, and potential media and radio coverage um, which could be sought. It is also anticipated that support organisations would encourage individuals to share their views with the committee and in due course consideration be given to holding informal private meetings with victims similar to those that were held with victims of domestic abuse. Um, so if members are content with those proposals, unless there's any other suggestions, Linda, I think your hand's up. Hi, Chair, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that um, the proposals are signed. I'm just wondering, um, it's only a suggestion, in terms of the the media and trying to get those particularly victims to engage, would there be value in the potential of of using uh, an actual victim who's prepared to speak out on those platforms about their own experience and therefore the importance of engaging with this um, consultation and and in relation to the legislation? I mean. It's, it's not really for me to, to suggest who that would be, but we, we do know that there are probably, in fact, we know there are definitely people out there who would be prepared to speak out and who probably have a good reach out into, um, in terms of media and and all of the all of the types of media platforms. And I, and I think the more coverage we can get and the more engagement we can get, the better. And I can only speak for myself. Um, I'm not great <laughs> at... at this kind of stuff, it, it's not my forte in terms of getting that out, reach out into the, the community in the way you would like to get it on, on social media and all. It's 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 not one of my stronger points, let's put it that way, as, as much as I might try. But there certainly are people out there that are good at that kind of engagement. And that's not to take away from anything the chair would do. I think that the chair should absolutely be taking the lead on this. But if there was the potential to, to include or to involve somebody like that, I think it would it would be beneficial. Yeah, no, very much so. I, I can think of one who comments regularly in the media and the newspapers. Yeah. And I'll suggest that after this meeting to Christine. But if there's any others that people can think of, just drop the clerk a note and um, we can get the, the Assembly comms people to, to reach out to them. I I certainly would be more than willing to, to facilitate that myself. There's no issue on that for me. Um, I think we're probably thinking the same person, Chair, so I'm going to leave it with you to decide. I, I don't have any preference to who it is, so I think, but I think it's probably the same individual. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sinead Bradley? No, Chair, just to, yeah, just to support that call, I think it is um, wise and it is very public facing and it may be um, that we need to reassure people because of the sensitivities of this issue. Um, it's hard to beat hearing that voice of the person who has had the experience and I suppose whilst of course it's important we have somebody if we can find somebody that's willing to um, do that in a public way and have the public conversation but to also put value on letting people know that they can engage in an anonymous way with this consultation um, because I think as many voices we hear because there's so many different considerations that we we need to play out, I suppose, when we're looking at the legislation. So I'd just be mindful of keeping the balance right of saying, yes, you know, we need a public voice, but it's a safe place and there is a way of being part of this in an anonymous fashion because people would be very reluctant to maybe come out publicly on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Rachel Woods. 
Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Sorry, it, it's already been covered in terms of I think we're all thinking of a, of a similar person that might have some reach um, publicly, but also just if we are discussing it publicly to make sure that we signpost people who may be listening to appropriate support services and that they can get assistance if they are going di to be divulging information, say, to us as a committee through our evidence gathering, that that might bring up some um, some previous trauma and that they can then report on. I think it would be good just to even encourage reporting if, if they hadn't already. Yeah, no, good point. Okay, well, listen, um, if there's anyone else, I'll have a chat to Christine after this session, and if there's anyone else, please feel free to, to drop our note on that, but um, we will proceed then on that basis. Uh, item 8 um, on the agenda is the Police Service of Northern Ireland um, and PSNI Reserve Injury Benefit Regs. Uh, this statutory rule amends various instruments relating to um, these regulations to ensure that the police injury duty scheme continues to work effectively for officers who join the career average police pension scheme established in 2015 so that they will have the same access to benefits provided through the police injury benefit regs as are available to officers who are members of earlier pension schemes. The amendments also resolve the offset issue identified in the Northern Ireland Audit Office report that was published in March 2020. Technical updates will also be made to the Employment uh, Support Alliance and Incapacity Benefit at our meeting on the 14th of January. Officials attended um, from the Department to provide further information and clarity, uh, following which the Committee agreed that it was content with the proposed statutory rule. The rule was laid by the Department on the 24th of February. It is subject to negative resolution. There has been no changes to the policy content since the Committee considered the SL1. The examiner of stat rules has drawn uh, special attention to the rule in relation to errors in its drafting, and the Department has confirmed that it will make amendments to correct the errors at the earliest opportunity. There are also a number of minor typographical errors which the Department has confirmed will be corrected by way of a uh, correction slip. So, If members are content with the statutory rule, then I will proceed um, to put the question. Ra Rachel, I have your hand up. That is maybe from last time. No, you are okay. Okay. No, it's fine. Thank you, Barry. No, you're okay. That's fine. Then uh, I'll put the question to members that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2021 forward slash 43, the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Police Service of Northern Ireland Reserve injury benefit regulations, and has no objection to the rule. Agreed. 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 Okay. Thank you. Item nine. Um, the Minister of Justice has provided a copy of the report of the review of the lessons arising from the legislative error within the Sexual Offences Order 2008, which led to the PPS setting aside a number of convictions for certain sexual offences prosecuted between 2009 and 2017. The report provides an assessment of where the system went wrong and has found that a major factor which contributed to the situation occurred in the planning for the implementation of the order. Additional factors included the lack of recognition or intention within the NIO for the practical implications of the repeal provisions within Schedule 1 of the order and the reliance by independent criminal justice stakeholders upon the NIO to highlight significant changes that would impact operationally. Um, some practical tools and actions are proposed to assist those engaged in developing policy and instructing Legislative Council to avoid such errors in the future. So members, it's here for us um, to note, unless some members wish to, to make comment. Um, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, I suppose the first point to make is, is just to again acknowledge that, you know, whilst this was error in legislation, there were victims at the other side of it. And I mean, just to acknowledge those people, those individuals, and the fact that many of them will have been re-traumatised, and no one, I'm, I'm sure, other many members may be in the same position, but I certainly was contacted by several of, of those victims with real concerns about what it meant for them and, and fears around the fact that, that potentially the, the perpetrator, the person who had been found guilty, might now have their, their name cleared. And that, that was a, a very concerning issue and, and remains to be so for some. Um, but just to put on the record, Chair, well, first of all, I would like DOJ to give us to come back to us, or you know, with a response on the proposed recommendations. You know what what their view of those recommendations are and, and how they'll be implemented. And also, just again to place on the record, this was legislation that was, I think, 
blushed clearly by looking at this report uh, ill thought out and the the implications for what you know what would happen as a result of of the legislation were were not brought into were not thought about were not considered and, and that that's a real concern i would like to think that we would never allow as an assembly the same type of thing to be ha- to happen again but we can never say i wouldn't I wouldn't want to be so arrogant as to think that it's impossible because it's not and we do make mistakes and that's the reality of life but i would certainly not like to think that we would ever make this kind of mistake it wasn't our mistake in the first place but i wouldn't like to think that we would repeat it as an assembly just want to place that on the record chair because of the fact that we are talking about victims who were traumatized and then were re-traumatized as a result of what happened as a result of this mistake Okay, well, we can seek the update in terms of that recommendations from the, de- the department. And those points are, are well made, and I agree with them. Um, item 10, then, members, uh, is the UK Financial Services Bill. The Minister has provided information in relation to a request from the Economic Secretary to the Treasury on the 8th of February to consider legislative consent for a clause in the Financial Services Bill. The purpose of the clause is to ensure that law enforcement is able to quickly and efficiently freeze and forfeit the proceeds of crime and terrorist property, not just held in bank and building society accounts, but also when in e-money and payment institution accounts. The Minister has indicated that the clause, which was added to the Bill as a Government amendment in January, engages uh, devolved competence in respect of the proceeds of crime only and the extension of the provision to the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act. 2001 in respect of freezing and forfeiting terrorist property um, does not require legislative consent and will automatically apply to Northern Ireland on enactment. Um, it's just to advise members that the 16th of March was the final date for securing an LCM. The Minister has therefore advised the Economic Secretary to the Treasurer um, that it isn't possible for an LCM to proceed within that time scale. If additional time is not possible, then the UK Government will table an amendment on the 17th of March so that the provision does not extend to Northern Ireland and the Minister will lay a memorandum in the Assembly explaining why an LCM is not being sought. The Minister is also considering how to ensure that any potential risks are identified and minimised within the relevant 2017 Criminal Finances Act. Provisions are enacted here, including legislating either in the Assembly or if there is another suitable bill going through Westminster in which the provision can be included. Um, so, obviously, members, it's pretty concerning in terms of the way in which this has developed, um, although it would appear uh, that it is as a result of um, the way in which the UK government have handled this as opposed to um, the Department of Justice has handled it, um, and I'm not sure there's much we as a committee are able to do in respect of that. So um, if I can bring in uh, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. I, I think you're right. I'm not sure there's much we as a committee are, are in a position to do. And, and in fairness to the department, it does look like it, it, it's been the, the British government's issue here. Can we maybe just, and it's more for information, can we maybe um, write to the policing board to find out what the implications of this are for the PSNA in terms of, of their, their own powers, the, the implications of not having access to this, I suppose, is, is the better way to put it. Apologies, Chair. You're okay. Okay. There's just a couple other members, so let me bring them in and then we'll try and pull this all together. Sinead Bradley and then Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Can, yeah. Signal's not great. Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we okay. can hear you. Oops. Okay. Uh, Chair, I suppose really it's the timeline around this that's really concerning me. You know, I'm not always a great supporter of LCMs, but I do like to have my right to object to them or not to object to them, as in some cases. And, and in this particular case, I just would be really mindful that um, whilst the department may have had a very short window, I, I don't think, I think this is the only time, and I stand to be corrected, that it's really been brought to the attention of the committee. Um, so at this stage, you know, are we, are we arriving at a new place where an LCM can be presented at committee? 
and regardless of our view, you know, the time has passed. Um, and I just wonder, did it happen yesterday and what the minister's intent is going forward? Um, but I, I do think as a committee, we should be registering at every level our objection to this, the, the timing of it. Okay. Um, and then I'll bring Rachel in. And then I know the clerk had been trying to just identify if, if what had happened yesterday did happen. And then I'll bring Christine in. So Rachel Wood. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Maybe it was my ignorance and not looking at um, any um, progression of this in Westminster yesterday. Um, but did it happen yesterday? Um, I'm just that would be of interest um, to see if they did table an amendment. But also just with, um, and I appreciate that the minister may not have information. I completely appreciate the position that the department have been put in with this. But in terms of the risks. Um, and the absence of access to powers to freeze money, um, and also just for out of my own interest, I suppose. But um, does this include scope over cryptocurrency? So those would be my my three questions. Okay, Christine, do you want to just update us on whether the amendment was tabled? Yes, um, just to confirm, she made this is the first time that it's been brought to the attention of the committee. Um, and also, we did check and have been advised that the amendment was led yesterday um, by the UK government. Okay, so members had raised there was a couple of points just to try and get clarity on um, to raise with the, the police board and also then um, with the Department of Justice in respect of um, cryptocurrency. And if there's any other issues, um, we will correspond. On those and come back to the committee in due course on it. Um, I agree with Sinead in terms of you know, registering our unhappiness at, at the way in which the timings of all of this have taken place. Um, so we will we'll put that together in terms of expressing that concern. Okay, members. Um, then the next item to deal with is just um, correspondence. Um, I can take members through that. There's five items of correspondence in the meeting pack and then there's one item in the tabled pack. Let me draw attention to one of the items. Uh, item one of correspondence uh, in the meeting pack is a response from the department providing the information requested by the committee on the impact of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol on the justice sector including any funding implications and the potential impact of the Laguna uh, convention on cross-border civil justice cooperation. The department has indicated that no costs have been identified for the wider justice sector relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol, other than the PSNI requirements, and states that it is not possible to completely separate the impact of EU exit and the protocol, as one is a result of the other, and that the trade and cooperation agreement and future security partnership are interdependent. Uh, in relation to the uh, Lagano Convention. The Department has indicated that if the UK is not party to it, there will be potential for a lack of clarity over which domestic court is jurisdiction and a risk of more expensive and longer parallel proceedings. So, members, that information is there um, for us to note. Unless there is any further information needed, we will duly note it. Um, if members are content, we will request a written update on the EU exit issues and how the new justice arrangements are working from the Department um, in September um, to keep members informed on that front. So, item one then in the table pack is correspondence on behalf of the Chairperson's Liaison Group providing a questionnaire seeking views on how committee scrutiny could be improved and strengthened. Um, the CLG would like MLAs to complete the questionnaire individually. By the 31st of March. And if members are content, then we'll action the other items of the correspondence as set out by the clerk in the cover sheet. Unless Agreed. Okay, thank you. I have no chairman's business. Is there any other business members wish to raise at this stage? Sure. Yes, Linda. Can I? Just a quick question. Um, in relation to the a timeline for the meeting with the reference group on the victims' payments, I was wondering, do we have any idea when roughly we might be intending to do that? Um, we've got a contact to um, make the arrangements. So we're um, in the process of just, I think, putting out to you and the chair 
for possible dates that would suit you and then we'll liaise back with them. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay. Members, well, if there's no other business, then um, we'll conclude the meeting and the next one will be Thursday the 25th at 2 p.m. and that would be in room 30 for those joining in the building and then um, via the Starley facility uh, as well. So, members, thank you very much. We'll adjourn the meeting. Program signed. Thank you, Chair. This is the...